Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to Civil War General 2. Uh, we are looking at the Battle of Mechanicsville from the uh, Seven Days Campaign, or the Seven Days Battle. And it is a continuation of a series that I started a while ago. If you recall, the last video we did touched on the Battle of Seven Pines. Uh, the Battle of Seven Pines was an engagement in front of Richmond in which the Confederate commanding general Joseph E. Johnston was wounded and led directly to the ascension of Robert E. Lee to command of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. With that being said, let's provide a little bit of background because it has been a while since our last video. Now, just as a reminder, uh, I do a lot of live streams nowadays where I talk more about playing the game, but kind of the crux of my channel, or at least uh, historically going back, you know, four years, what I've also done a lot of is historical discussions. And sometimes it's hard to do that during live streams. Uh, this video was actually taken during a live stream, but I'm cutting out the original audio and replacing it with a historical discussion of the Battle of Mechanicsville. So I'm sorry, I'm not really going to be talking too much about the gameplay itself. Uh, the gameplay is more or less filler or secondary uh, to the discussion about the battle. One other note I will have is that I had hoped to have some Ultimate General Civil War up, uh, but unfortunately the game hasn't come out quite yet. I have some uh, sources that seem to be telling me that it should be up within a day or two, uh, and at that point I'll probably do some live streams. But uh, this is the Battle of Mechanicsville. This is Civil War General 2, a 1997 classic, in my opinion, uh, made by Sierra. It is a turn-based game, very much in the vein of Panzer General, almost like the Panzer General of the Civil War. Uh, I am playing the Grand Campaign, which involves more than 20 major battles that took place, including almost all of the Seven Days battles uh, during the Civil War, and links them together in a linking and branching campaign, very similar to the way that Panzer General does, and to some extent there's carryover casualties for units that uh, continue to fight throughout the war and carry over battle to battle. Um, but anyway, that's not really the focus of this video. So let's go back and let's talk about the Battle of Seven Pines. So in our last video, we talked about how Seven Pines was the culmination, really, of the Peninsula Campaign. Well, the Seven Days really are, but they're kind of their own thing. So we'll call the Seven Days the culmination of the initial Peninsula Campaign uh, with the Seven Days Battles as sort of the, the main event following that campaign. But the, but the Battle of Seven Pines was a result of General George McClellan, the Union Army of the, the Union Army Commander of the Army of the Potomac, uh, daring plan to land on the York James Peninsula in Virginia, outflank the Confederate Army that was stationed around Centersville or Manassas. Uh, Centersville and Manassas was along the direct line between Washington and Richmond, and the Confederates had built a large fortification network there. So McClellan, rather than attacking with vast numerical superiority, although he didn't believe he had such, uh, against some heavily dug-in rebels, some, what, like 90 miles from Richmond or so, uh, decided, I'm going to outflank the entire enemy, and I'm going to land on the York James Peninsula, which was uh, a somewhat similar distance from Richmond, but would have outflanked all the Confederate heavy works. It was a brilliant plan in many regards, and harkens back to the campaign of Winfield Scott in Mexico during the Mexican-American War. It's a similar strategy that you'll see the U.S. military use in World War II at the Battle of Anzio or during the island hopping campaigns during World War II. It seems to be a United States military philosophy to outflank the enemy by naval landings at sea. Uh, which is somewhat interesting. You could say it's almost the hallmark of American military planning in terms of uh, various campaigns that occur. The idea of always using the sea and using the navy to outflank the enemy in a way that you know the British kind of tried at uh, at Gallipoli, sort of in a very different way. Uh, but the Americans have had quite a bit of success uh, either during the Mexican-American War or during World War II, and you could even say during the Peninsula Campaign, uh, McClellan caught. Johnson off guard, and uh, Johnson had to race his forces to the peninsula. However, McClellan's own uh, paranoia, his own lack of confidence, led him to delay severely, as we discussed in our last video. Uh, he ended up taking more than a month 
to just advance a short distance up the peninsula to capture Yorktown, stopped there for about a month, brought up siege guns, and then by the time he was ready to begin the siege of the Confederate Army, which had now completely repositioned itself into, into Yorktown uh, and negated most of the advantage of going around the Confederates, uh, the Confederates had withdrawn before McClellan could actually attack. There were some minor engagements at the Battle of Williamsburg where the uh, Union Army ran into some Confederate rear guard uh, forces and General Winfield Scott Hancock, a major figure later in the war, gained his uh, Hancock the Superb tagline. But all in all, uh, despite some minor engagements, McClellan advanced up the peninsula toward Richmond. The Confederate commander, Joseph E. Johnston, was more than willing to uh, abide by this and allowed him to advance up the peninsula. Before advancing to literally the last stop between Richmond and the Union Army, the last place, just a few miles from Richmond, the last line of defense just beyond the Chickahominy River in front of Richmond uh, for the Confederates to stand. And there were growing tensions in the Confederate camp between President Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and the Confederate commanding general, Joseph E. Johnson. Johnson was seemingly unwilling to attack, seemingly unwilling to stand and, and to fight. He had reason to be concerned. The Union Army substantially outnumbered his own. He had some 60,000 men, and McClellan had some 100,000 men, almost 120 if you include forces all the way back down the peninsula. So understandably, he was very careful about not becoming engaged in a major battle. However, that meant that as McClellan advanced, Johnson withdrew. And again, there was a great tension that would grow between Davis and Johnson, and you would see this almost the same exact pattern develop during the Atlanta campaign in 1864, where Johnson would continually withdraw in front of Sherman, fight a few minor battles, but then be outmaneuvered and end up withdrawing again without a decisive blow or an attempt of a decisive blow being fought. Um, and again, another scenario where Jefferson Davis became very frustrated with him. But this one ended a little bit differently. So in front of Richmond, McClellan seemingly made a mistake. The Chickamauga River, as we mentioned, was swollen and over its banks, and half the Union Army was on one side of the river, the other half was on another, only linked by some tenuous pontoon bridges which no one thought were usable during the, the heavy rains. So Johnson launches an attack on the Union forces, a complicated flanking maneuver and an attempt to crush one wing of the Union Army. He thought, hey, listen, I've got 60,000 men. I can bring the majority of these to bear against a much smaller Union force due to the, you know, the river isolating part of the army. And he brought some, at least attempted to bring some 60,000 men against 40,000 Union troops. General Sumner helped save the day, the Union 2nd Corps commander, who raced troops across the Chickahominy River despite the swollen river. Uh, he overcame the objections of a engineer who told him, you know, you can't cross, these bridges won't hold, and he said they must hold, and uh, went across anyway. And on, the ba on May 31st, 1862, the second major engagement in the Eastern Theater, the first being Bull Run in 1861, was fought at the Battle of Seven Pines. I'm elaborating a little bit more because it's been a while since we've talked about about the battle. You know, it's been a while since the last video. But during the Battle of Seven Pines in the evening of May 31st, 1862, Joseph E. Johnston was wounded. And that's where we left you last time. Johnston is wounded. Seven Pines is a bloody draw. The Confederates make some initial advances, but then are stopped by Union reinforcements, and the battle uh, devolves into a stalemate. It checked McClellan's advance, at least temporarily. You know, the fight caused him to reevaluate the situation. But the Confederate Army had lost its commander. Joseph E. Johnston, the victor of the Battle of Manassas, a hero to many in the Confederacy, uh, although, again, seemingly starting to lose faith of his president and had some conflicts with his president in, in the times up, you know, times prior. There was some disputes over rank and, and command and the fact that Robert E. Lee, I believe, was actually ranked above Johnson, even though he wasn't taking command of the field. And Johnson was wounded. With Johnson being wounded, Jefferson Davis and him at least temporarily making peace, command fell to G.W. Smith. G.W. Smith had been a confident and aggressive Confederate commander just weeks before. He had proposed a Confederate offensive on Philadelphia. And uh, as seems to be the case with himself and Boulder Guard and other Confederate commanders, they were very prone to being bluff until the chips were on the table, at least in the case of G.W. Smith. 
and G.W. Smith cracked. He went from a brash and aggressive commander to someone who had retreat on his mind. The very first thing that uh, he had told Jefferson Davis upon uh, assuming command of the army was that he would hold if he could, but he wasn't sure if he could, and he may have to withdraw. And remember, there's nowhere to retreat for the Confederate army. There's nowhere to go. Lee had mentioned before the battle that the next closest area they could withdraw to was some hundred miles south of Richmond. That would have meant conceding the, the capital of Virginia, would have meant conceding the capital of the Confederacy. And many thought at this stage in the war, at least many on the Union side, it's hard to know totally what the Confederates thought, that if the Confederate capital had fallen at this stage in the war, maybe, just maybe, the war would come to an end. So G.W. Smith was not the answer. May 31st, he had command of the Army of Northern Virginia. By June 1st, he had been replaced. And who did Davis replace him with? But none other than the now iconic and legendary figure of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, the hero, or one of the heroes, one of the many heroes of the American Mexican-American War in 1848, I believe it was, uh, a commander who would become beloved by many on both sides, at the time had a dubious reputation. Lee was known more for surrender or retreat. He had been in command of the Western Virginia Theater with scant resources and conflicting personalities amongst commanders. He hadn't done a very good job in managing those commanders, but he had also been heavily outnumbered. He had faced McClellan as well in the theater in Western Virginia, and his reputation at the time had led him to have the nickname of Evacuating Lee. Not a very famous or popular nickname for any particular commander, although uh, admittedly later in the war the, the, the term may have been more appropriate for Joseph E. Johnston than Robert E. Lee. But as we know, Robert E. Lee would not maintain that nickname for long. He would become one of the most iconic commanders of the Confederate Army, uh, one of the most iconic military figures in American history. So June 1st, 1862, Robert E. Lee takes command of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, at the gates of Richmond, with the Union Army knocking, and the doom of the Confederacy upon it. But then something funny happened. Weather and McClellan's own uh, hesitancy or indecisiveness came to save the Confederacy. McClellan just sat there. Lee, new to command of the army, an army in disorganization after a failed attack, a disastrous and, and somewhat discombobulated army, Scattered, unclear, leadership unclear, not quite sure, you know, what the shape of the army was in. If McClellan had pushed hard then, who knows what would have happened. But he didn't. He gave Lee almost an entire month to reorganize the army under himself. He gave Lee almost an entire month to plan on what he was going to do. McClellan sat in front of Richmond and told President Abraham Lincoln... I will attack Richmond when the weather cooperates. When the roads harden, when the rain stops, when maneuver becomes easy, I will, I will move. But in doing so, he conceded the initiative to Robert E. Lee, the new commander of the Confederacy, and it would soon become apparent that Lee was no evacuator. He was no cautious figure. Some had said he was too old. That was indeed not the case. He set about reorganizing the army as best he could, and strengthening the army. Troops were brought in from the Richmond defensive fortifications, troops were brought in from the southern Virginia coast, and the army of some 60,000 men swelled to a wartime high of about 92,000. The strongest army that the Confederacy would ever have was now in front of Richmond, some 92,000 men strong, facing off against roughly 105,000 Union troops. Outnumbered to be sure, but not anywhere near the two-to-one scenario that Joseph E. Johnston had to deal with on the peninsula. The Union Army remained around the same place, around the Chickahominy River, just east and north of Richmond. General McClellan waiting for General McDowell's troops to come south from Fredericksburg, sitting up there. General Lee had brought in General Stonewall Jackson's division or corps, whatever you want to call it, from the valley where it had just accomplished great feats, which we'll talk upon in, in later videos, uh, defeating some three Union armies in detail, despite being heavily outnumbered, marching vast 
distances and short periods of time, catching armies by surprise and throwing them back and throwing the North into a panic. So Jackson comes back to Richmond to help Lee on his new plan. And that plan is basically the same thing as Joseph E. Johnston's plan. Johnson's plan was to launch an attack on a wing of the Union Army that was weaker than the other, bring his forces to bear, leave a small force behind to hold the main, the main body of the Union Army in place. Again, gambling on McClellan's own caution and, and unwillingness to act decisively. And fall on one portion of the Union Army and destroy it. If Lee could destroy 30,000, 40,000 Union troops, he would change the balance of power in the theater. He would either force McClellan to unceremoniously retreat with the greatest defeat in the entire war, or he would open McClellan up to being heavily outnumbered. Remember, the Confederacy is only behind the Union by about 12,000 men, so if you're 13,000 men. So if you assume the Union loses about 40% of their force, now the Confederates have an overwhelming preponderance of force. And that could change the entire balance of power, at least in the near term, in the Eastern Theater. It could open up a whole bunch of opportunities. And nature continued to afford the Confederacy an advantage. The Chickahominy River was swollen. It was flooded due to long rains during the spring. But even as late as June 25th of 1862, the river was still swollen. It was over its banks. It was uh, difficult to pass. And still, the Union Army was split. Some 40,000 men were north of the river, some 65,000 men south. General Lee was going to leave two divisions of his army on the south bank of the river and swing the vast majority of his force, more than 60,000 men, north of the river to attack 20,000 fewer Union troops. That was the plan. The plan was arrived at thanks to a daring operation made by a Confederate commander, Jeb Stuart, in charge of Robert E. Lee's cavalry. Some weeks before, Stuart had ridden around the entire Union army at the behest of, of Lee. Lee wanted to gain an understanding of where the Union forces were and what was, you know, whether their flanks were in the air, whether they could be attacked. And Stuart, in a scene which he would attempt to repeat to disastrous effect during the uh, Gettysburg campaign, met with some tremendous success, embarrassing the Union, riding around with, bra with bravado unheard of, almost like a Marshal Murat figure of Napoleonics, around the Union Army, escaped their pursuit, and returned to Lee, bringing him the intelligence he needed. And so Lee was ready by June 25th of 1862, just some 24 days after taking command of the largest army that the Confederacy would ever raise. Robert E. Lee, newly minted commander, was ready to throw off the defensive and fall full mel into an offensive against the Union Army. It's important to know that Lee knew he could not wait on the defensive. Some 92,000 men, you might be tempted to say, okay, well, let's sit back and let's defend against the Union. You know, we've got a slight numerical deficiency. We can make up for that with entrenchments and defenses, and the Union will attack, and we'll, you know, absorb them and inflict grievous casualties on us, or on them, as, as they do little to us. That would be the tempting thing to do, but Lee knew that was a losing game. Because remember, while the advantage was only slight... It was still substantial, still more than a division. And even worse, more than 20,000 Union troops were north, near Manassas. You had over 20,000 more around, Rich or around uh, Washington, and another 12 to 15,000 men west of Washington, kind of in that valley area. The Union could easily have brought another 50,000 men south, in addition to the 10,000 men that they had at Fort Monroe. So if the Confederate army was boxed up in a siege around Richmond, the Union could bring an additional 50,000 men and have nearly a two-to-one advantage against the Confederacy if necessary. Lee knew also that the Union had vastly superior siege guns. The Confederacy was not prepared for a siege. Richmond's defenses were not yet up to the par that they would be by 1864, even though Lee knew then as well that a siege was a losing bet. And Lee didn't want to stay cooped up. His army was not an army ready to withstand a siege. 
He decided the best thing for the army was to launch an offensive, and it would be bloody, and it would be costly. It would be one of the costliest campaigns of the entire Civil War for the Confederacy. It would be one of the first times that you see an extended series of battles over seven days take place in a way that you would see in something like World War I or World War II, where the battle doesn't happen for one day, doesn't happen for two days, doesn't happen for three days. It happens over a full week, fighting every single day. Reminiscent of modern warfare, not reminiscent of, you know, most musketry-era conflicts. It was a predecessor in some ways to the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, when for some 20 days, I want to say it was, there was fighting every single day, engagements every single day, some days more major than others, and both armies would wear themselves out. And that's what the seven days was. Except in 1862, the Confederacy was better prepared for that. They were more able to withstand 20,000 casualties as they would lose during the Seven Days Campaign. They were more ready to accept the cost at the price of victory. They were more able to replace their numbers because the war was only a year old. And so General Robert E. Lee launches his army forward, General Magruder being one of the divisions that's left behind to defend the south bank of the Chickahominy. General Jackson would move north. General Longstreet would move north. And I want to say some five divisions would move north with two staying south. This is the first engagement of the Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee. And it's the first that you would see the iconic figures of Longstreet and Jackson really starting to stand apart as commanders who would be influential throughout the remainder of the war or the remainder of their lives. And so the Battle of Mechanicsville would be a direct result. But it wasn't the first battle. As you can see here in this game, it's, this is June 26th. June 25th is when the Seven Days started. And Civil War Generals 2 does not model June 25th. That's because June 25th was a minor, or relatively minor, engagement. The battle was the Battle of Oak Grove. It took place on June 25th. It was an inconclusive fight. And it involved General Huger's division of Robert E. Lee and three brigades under General Heinzelman, under General McClellan. Roughly equal forces on each side, although I did a little bit of digging and couldn't find the exact figures or exact numbers of the number of troops engaged. Uh, the battle was actually a almost a spoiling attack. General McClellan, for all his inactivity, uh, was actually aware that the Confederates were planning an attack. In many ways, the Battle of uh, Old Tavern or Oak Grove was not uh, a battle that was part of the Seven Days Battles. We had already talked about how General Lee was going to attack the northern bank of the Chickahominy River, and he was going to attempt to smash uh, a small portion of the Union Army. However, this was not really involved in that. What this was was a spoiling attack. General McClellan knew that Lee was about to launch an attack. He knew he wanted to move his siege artillery about a mile closer to Richmond so he could start hitting some of these forts and some of these targets and really invest the city. So he launched this attack. It was a Union attack uh, under General Heinzelman against uh, General Huger's division, which was one of the divisions, I believe, in the south uh, of, the, of, of the river. Uh, and the Union attack was inconclusive. Uh, they had gained about 600 yards, so you know, not anywhere near the, the mile they wanted in territory. They had taken about 626 casualties, some 68 killed, over 500 wounded. The Confederates had taken about 440 casualties. Uh, the aftermath of the battle, it didn't really do much. So uh, at a battle of a total of 1,000 casualties, the Union uh, gained about 600 yards. Uh, but the offensive, while maybe making Lee a little bit nervous, it didn't do enough to uh, cause Lee to alter his offensive plans, which were set to begin the next day. Uh, the next day would be the Battle of Mechanicsville, which would be the first Confederate attack during the Seven Days Battle, and the Battle of Oak Grove uh, ended up being more of a sideshow. The attack occurred, and it wasn't sufficiently supported. Uh, there weren't enough Union troops behind it, and it failed to cause Lee to need to send any reinforcements or do anything of any kind uh, to deal with the attack, which allowed Lee to go forward on June 26th with his main effort, 
against the Union northern flank uh, at the Battle of Mechanicsville. And that's the battle we see here in front of us today. Uh, that is the battle that we are going to talk about in our next video. But we are about 25 minutes in, uh, and the footage for uh, the Battle of Mechanicsville is about an hour long. So it would make sense at this point if we go ahead and we uh, cut off the video here and uh, talk about um, the Battle of Mechanicsville in another video, in another part of, uh, of this series. So I hope you guys enjoyed the historical discussion. I know it's kind of re-framing uh, the whole scenario a bit uh, because it has been a while. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, and uh, until next time, uh, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching and I'm out.